When most of us think of the ruler of the sea in relation to Greek mythology, it's easy to think of Poseidon. Poseidon is after all most commonly associated with the sea, and for the most part, you'd be right in thinking that he was the sovereign of the seas. However, before Poseidon was even thought about, there was another entity who was considered to be not just the overlord of the oceans, but the ocean itself. He was a titan, born to the world by the primordials Uranus, the god of the sky, and Gaia, the goddess of earth, and was known to the world as Oceanus. Whilst there are many deities associated with the sea, from Poseidon himself to the many Oceanids and river gods, Oceanus is where it all started. As Homer tells us in the Odyssey, Oceanus, from whom all rivers are, and the entire sea and all springs, and all deep wells have their waters of him. It was Oceanus who was first associated with the waters themselves, and it was Oceanus who may have served as inspiration for the subsequent deities who would later take a more prominent role in the ruling of the seas throughout the mythology. Perhaps the reason so few people know of Oceanus, or why so few appear to associate him with the waters in mythology, is because of how prominent characters like Poseidon were in comparison. Oceanus for the most part took a back seat in the grand scheme of things, something he is notoriously remembered for when you consider that he did not take part in either Cronus' castration nor the Titanomachy. Characters like Poseidon, meanwhile, were far less shy, and far less humble with their manipulation of the waves, and Poseidon in particular is often celebrated for his sovereignty over the seas. We know Poseidon interacted with both water and land, but Oceanus never appeared to demonstrate such an ability, but instead, according to the ancients, remained only amongst the waters which flowed from him. Furthermore, Oceanus in some interpretations was the ocean itself, and therefore did not possess a physical human body like Poseidon. In this, it is no wonder why many leaned more towards Poseidon, for Poseidon was to the ancients a tangible being, one they could converse with and form a relationship with. Oceanus on the other hand was merely an element, something that could never be truly understood, much less bonded with. Despite this, the ancient Greeks did seek to personify Oceanus, as we can see from ancient pottery, where the titan appears as a bull-horned god, with the tail of a serpentine fish. In other variations, he appears to have crab claws for horns, and is often seen accompanied by an oar, a school of fish, or a serpent. The reasoning for Oceanus' disappearance is never really documented in Greek mythology, we know that Oceanus liked to keep himself to himself, and assuming he was a personified being, did not find much merit in the conflict between Uranus and Cronus. Much like the other children of Gaia, Oceanus did not wish to involve himself in the overthrowing of Uranus. Whilst the others shunned Gaia's pleas for help out of possible fear of their overlord father, Oceanus appears to have been more detached from such things, and was likely more in tune with the way of the world's water than he was with the political struggle that his mother was bothered by. Unlike the others, Oceanus appeared to be programmed more towards nature and the natural order of things, and appeared to be content so long as the ocean was alive. He did not share the ambitions of the more earthly Cronus, and therefore appeared to be apathetic towards who ruled, so long as the waters still flowed. Even in the Titanomachy, where Zeus had either imprisoned his kind or pitted them to face terrible tortures, Oceanus did not get involved. His own kind were decimated by the uprising of the Olympians, but still Oceanus did not pick a side and seemed content to be as still as the waters themselves. Zeus never appears to tackle Oceanus and appears to be happy to just let him be. There is some question as to whether Zeus had any power over Oceanus in the first place, for how could a god seek to punish the ocean? The ocean by nature is dispassionate, and cares not for the squabbles between men, nor the rank of others. It simply is. It can either nurture life or drown it, but neither is done with any intention or motive. Therefore, Zeus had no cause to tangle with the Titan, and even if he did, it is unknown how he would go about doing it without damning everyone else. After all, without water there can be no life, and so you could say that Zeus's hands were tied. However, Homer does tell us in the Odyssey that not powerful Achelos matches his strength against Zeus, not the enormous strength of Oceanus with his deep running waters, yet even Oceanus is afraid of the lightning of great Zeus, 
and the dangerous thunderbolt when it breaks from the sky crashing. This in itself is quite telling, and reminds us that even though Oceanus appeared to be impartial to the goings on around him, he still has some fear of Zeus. And who could blame him, given what Zeus had done to his kind? Because of Oceanus' potential power as the ocean, he serves to remind us of how powerful Zeus actually is. For if even the ocean itself fears Zeus, then mere mortals should be terrified of him. The Greek philosopher Procus painted Oceanus as much less an indifferent character, but more of an indecisive one. In his commentary of Plato's Timaeus, he refers to several lines of an Orphic poem, where Oceanus is brooding as to whether he should be siding with Cronus or whether he should be siding with Uranus. Much like the myths though, Oceanus remains dormant and never appears to pick a side, despite his lamentations. In the aftermath of the Titanomachy, it would appear that Zeus stripped Oceanus of his rank as the ruler of the oceans, and that this was then handed to his brother, Poseidon, who we are all more acquainted with. It's possible that Zeus wanted to keep the ruling of the world in the family, and possibly did not trust that Oceanus, a titan, would remain docile forever. It would certainly prove troublesome for Zeus if Oceanus suddenly decided that he opposed the Olympian rule, and turned against him. So instating Poseidon appeared to be a sensible move, for at least he could trust Poseidon on some level, and would be able to deal with him should he turn. Whilst Oceanus was not destroyed, he was relegated to become just another god of the sea, one who still maintained worship amongst the ancients, but not one who would have influence that Poseidon would one day come to have. Another idea is that whilst Oceanus was stripped of his rank, he maintained rule of the Atlantic Ocean, whilst Poseidon ruled over the Mediterranean Sea. Despite never picking a side in both the war between Uranus and Cronus and the Titanomachy, Hesiod suggests that Oceanus may have had a preference in the latter conflict, and that was to side with Zeus. He notes that Oceanus sent his daughter Styx and her children Envy, Victory, Power and Force to fight on Zeus's side against the Titans. In this, Oceanus' support for the Olympians seems to be unquestionable, and it's possible that this was the reason why he was allowed to remain in existence without any severe punishment after the war. It's also possible that by sending Styx and her offspring to fight for Zeus, he could lend the Olympians his support, whilst remaining seemingly impartial so as to not warrant the angst from his titan brothers and sisters. By this, Oceanus takes on a new set of characteristics, ones of craftiness and furtiveness, as well as a sense of unpredictability and roguishness, much like the ocean itself. After all, the ocean holds no allegiance to anyone, and so, it cannot be blamed for what it feeds and what it destroys. This perhaps is why Zeus demoted the Titan after the war ended, for it is in Oceanus' nature to be flexible with his alliances. As previously stated, it would appear that all sea life originated with Oceanus. It was his sister wife Tethys that Oceanus parented several children, including the Oceanids, the ocean nymphs, and the rivers themselves, including that of the river Styx, that flowed into the underworld. An interesting parallel within mythology is that the nymphs, all of whom were descendants of Oceanus, were each responsible for a body of water throughout the world, and so, much like the lakes, rivers and streams all led back to Oceanus, all the entities associated with them also led back to Oceanus via their heritage. According to Hesiod, amongst Oceanus' offspring were the river gods, such as Achelos, the god of the Achelous River, and the largest river in Greece, and also Alpheus, the god of the Alpheus River, and the longest river in Greece. Alongside these gods, as previously mentioned, were the Oceanids, the ocean nymphs, of which there were 3,000, from Metis, the first wife of Zeus, Eurenome, the third wife of Zeus, Clymene, the wife of Iapetus, and the mother of Atlas, Minotius, Prometheus, and Epimetheus, and Perse, the wife of Helios, god of the sun, to name a few. Most notably, Styx, the goddess of the river Styx, was also a daughter of Oceanus. Whilst the rivers get much of the recognition and love, the lakes and smaller bodies of water are much less associated with Oceanus, almost like forgotten children of the great titan. In his poem Dionysiaca, 
The poet Nonnus perfectly sums up the existence of the lake entities as the liquid daughters cut off from Oceanus. Whilst it is generally accepted that Oceanus was the child of Uranus and Gaia, there are suggestions within the Iliad itself, amongst other sources, that it was Oceanus and Tethys who were the primeval parents of the gods, and not Uranus and Gaia. It is Hera in the Iliad herself who notes Oceanus and Tethys as being the source of which the gods are sprung from, saying, Oceanus, from whom the gods are sprung, and mother Tethys. And through this, it might be said that there are variations where Oceanus and Tethys are the father and mother of the gods, and not the titan offsprings of Uranus and Gaia. However, some debate this account by Hera, and believe she was referring to Oceanus and Tethys as merely foster parents, given that Hera was sent to Oceanus and Tethys for safekeeping and guardianship during the war. Interestingly, Homer later refers to Oceanus as the Genesis for all, furthermore implying that it was Oceanus who was the father of all things, and not just the river gods and nymphs. In some Orphic traditions, meanwhile, Oceanus and Tethys are the children of Uranus and Gaia, but here they become the parents of Cronus and Rhea, and not their siblings, suggesting that there was yet another generation of titans in between. A common debate regarding Oceanus is whether or not he was treated as a person or as a location. Both Hesiod and Homer appear to refer to Oceanus as a place, or at least as the water itself, as he is dubbed as the perfect river by Hesiod, whilst Homer makes mention of a stream of the river Oceanus. Verbs such as flowing and deep swirling are often used to describe him, furthermore suggesting that he has no physical body, but instead a watery form. Homer also tells us that Oceanus bound the earth, and the ancient Greeks would come to believe that the ocean, which encapsulated the world, was the manifestation of Oceanus himself. According to some ideas, Helios, the sun, sails up and down Oceanus, marking the cycle of day. As far as Oceanus being a location though, both Hesiod and Homer continue that Oceanus could be found at the ends of the earth, somewhere near Tartarus in the Theogony, or near Elysium in the Iliad. The Odyssey tells us that Oceanus needed to be crossed, again implying that the entity took the form of an ocean, and that this was necessary to reach the house of Hades. Oceanus here would become something of a boundary between the more corporeal world and the more fantastical one, a world filled with the Hesperides, the Gorgons, and other marvellous creatures and exotic tribes. With this idea, Oceanus becomes a crossing into the unknown, a checkpoint by which explorers and adventurers could find themselves in a time when the world was still young and anything could have been on the horizon. In Aeschylus's Prometheus Bound, Oceanus appears in a human form and visits the tragic Prometheus when he is chained and mauled by the eagle. Whilst here, Oceanus offers his sympathies to Prometheus, given his plight, once more suggesting the nature of Oceanus as the ocean, in that it can offer comfort. But Prometheus is not keen on Oceanus's presence and proceeds to berate him for his cowardice in hiding away from the conflict. He questions Oceanus's bravery, wondering how he has the courage to emerge now that the battle is done and Zeus is triumphant. Oceanus though does not seem to react and merely tells Prometheus that he should be humble now that Zeus is the new ruler and that he should keep his mouth shut so as to avoid incurring an even worse punishment. But Prometheus, ever the virtuous, declares that he envies Oceanus because Oceanus has escaped blame, despite being a titan himself. In this, there is a jibe by Prometheus that highlights Oceanus's indifference as gutlessness, and that he too should be suffering this fate, for he should have stood up to Zeus as well. In another tale by the historian Pherecydes of Athens, Oceanus once had an encounter with Heracles on one of his many travels, and that for some reason, Oceanus sought to provoke Heracles by sending upon him high waves to rock the boat. Vexed over this inconvenience, Heracles turned his bow upon the waters and threatened to shoot Oceanus. Out of fear, Oceanus calmed the waves and didn't bother Heracles again. Whether Oceanus was a personified being, or whether he'd manifested as the ocean itself, 
It's clear that the character had some great importance to the ancient Greeks. At some point, he would have most certainly been a well-respected and revered god, given that he was, in essence, the source of water itself. He was also the father of many, many creatures and characters that would go on to populate and influence much of the mythology going forward, and in this, he leaves his mark upon these stories as something of a founder or catalyst for the emergence of some of our favourite characters. As always guys, if you've enjoyed today's video, then don't forget to give this video a thumbs up, and if you're interested, be sure to hit the join button to become a member of this channel. Be sure to subscribe to stay notified for more content, and I'll see you in the next video. Until next time.